going to be presenting on, in, on an induction program for cattle fattening. Um, so I'll start uh, by talking about the, the phases that you go through because there are specific things that you need to abide with um, from an animal health point of view uh, when you when, 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 when you're wanting to get your animals into the feedlot. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be presenting on in on an induction program for cattle fattening. Um, so I'll start uh, by talking about the, the phases that you go through because there are specific things that you need to abide with um, from an animal health point of view uh, when, you, when, 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 when you're wanting to get your animals into the feedlot. Um, and this will ensure maximum productivity. So basically, there are two phases um, that that we recognize um, uh, of induction, and the first phase is the gate phase. So the gate phase basically looks at the um, things that you do as 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 you take in your your cattle, like just after purchasing or bringing in your 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 own cattle from your own head into the feedlot. And the gate phase uh, particularly takes between one and five days, and I'm going to be expurgating on this in my next present in my next uh, um, slides. Uh, then the other phase is adaptation or acclimatization phase, and uh, for me this is one of the most important um, phases, um, second to the to the gate phase. And I'm sure my colleagues from National Foods will also be able to explain further on it, but I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, try to introduce it to everyone so that um, at least you, you get to understand uh, the implications from an animal health point of view. Um, then, uh, so I'll start with the gate phase. So the gate phase, it, 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 it looks at the procedures uh, that are done on arrival, um, either uh, from a purchase or from a sale, um, if the animals on your on your farm, um, it may not always be necessary, um, and I'll explain why. So um, basically, the, the first stage is identification of animals, and uh, by identification we mean the the tagging of animals because you need to be tracking uh, the weight gains uh, so that at least you know what sort of management uh, to, to to carry out on the different animals. Um, then the second uh, thing is uh, external and internal parasite control. Uh, and this basically looks at the control of ticks um, and also uh, worms, which have got a negative um, impact on the weight gains of animals as, as soon as they get into the feedlot. And also the general disease control. Uh, and the assumption here is that most of the animals, as they get into the feedlot, um, if they are in what we call the incubation period, which is the period between um, infection and, um, and, and, and the point at which we start seeing the clinical signs or the clinical disease, it, it usually takes about two weeks. So if you buy any animal which is within that, that space, uh, you won't be able to actually identify whether it has disease or it doesn't. And this also explains certain things that are recommended, particularly on farms, when you buy your cattle, uh, such as um, quarantine. Uh, but I would assume uh, it may not be very important for, for feed lotting, unless if you're 
using your animals and animals that you will have bought outside. Okay, so I'll start on tick control. So in terms of um, tick control, um, animals from the different areas uh, usually come with varying tick infestations. Um, and uh, what I would call challenges because right now we've got a very big problem with blue tick resistance. Um, and our target in the animal health industry is to make sure that we don't get translocation of um, resistant blue ticks from one farm to the other. Um, and I will explain how we, 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 we avoid that. So the animals, as soon as they get, they, 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 they get into the feedlot, they are supposed to be dipped and sprayed with an, an effective dip on arrival. Um, and I would recommend uh, the usage of dips like um, um, your synthetic pyrethroids. Um, oh, these are super deep um, triatics or decatics. And there's also a poron which is got spot on, particularly when you know that they're heavy rains. would recommend the usage of uh, those pour on dips. Then in the case of blue tick resistance, we recommend uh, the usage of uh, what we call macrocyclic lactons or other mectins, uh, like um, bimectin in our case. If you look at this uh, image that I put on my slide on the right corner. Um, so from a feedlotting point of view, um, if you look at this picture that I'm projecting right now, um, from research 22 engorged, um, engorging bond ticks on, on a, on a cow per day result in, in cows in a loss of 20, 20 kgs uh, in body weight. Then in cows, 11 kgs. And in cows, it could also be seen as um, a loss in production where they're actually not gaining weight. Okay, then I move on to the next subject, which is uh, worm control. So this is uh, one of the most important things um, uh, to be done as you get your animals into the feedlot because of the impact of, um, of worms, or which I'm going to show you, or internal parasites. And the majority of the animals that are purchased for feedlotting might, might never have been dosed, depending on the area, particularly if you're getting your animals from communal areas uh, because of the knowledge gap. Uh, that's available in, in the communal areas, you, you get to see that most of them, they're actually still using traditional methods to, 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 to raise their animals. So they actually don't consider worm control as, a, as an important issue because it doesn't cause mortality um, immediately. Um, so worms of concern would be mainly your round worms, uh, liver and conical fluke. And I've deliberately left out the tapeworms because tapeworms are mainly an issue uh, to pre-winning cows. Um, then from research, we've seen that an infestation of 200 flukes, this is just as an example. Um, so an infestation of 200 flukes, per calf can cost for cost up to, to, to 28.5 reduction in average daily gain. So let's say your animal is supposed to, to be gaining, um, let's say maybe two cages for argument's sake. So that will mean that you, you, you it, it, it will actually be gaining 1.4 kgs instead of the, um, the, the, the actual two kgs. So you can see that loss. And if you calculate it backwards um, to the profits that you get at the end, um, it means that you may actually cut uh, your bottom line as a result of that. Then the above challenges can be addressed by products which we have at Coopers. And uh, these include um, Systemics Plus, um, news and drench, uh, or you could use uh, bimectin plus, which I, I would say it will be um, it's a three in one because it controls it controls the blue ticks, external parasites, plus um, the, the liver fluke and and the roundworms, which we are concerned um, about in this case. Um, then the other um, issue, which is also of importance from an animal health point of view, is disease control. And if you remember, in my first few, few, few slides, I spoke about the, um, the fact that most of the animals may actually be within their incubation period or the period between um, infection and the point at which 
we can see observable clinical signs. So that means you may, in, in, in our minds, we will have concluded that these animals are actually uh, not sick. So because of that, the specific things that we're supposed to do. Uh, so before we actually bring in animals into a feedlot or purchase animals, we, 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 we carry out what, what I would call a pre-purchase examination where we identify if there are any, any disease conditions that that animal has. Uh, because if we don't do that, we get into a situation where that animal may end up spreading disease to the other animals in the feedlot, uh, which will reduce production, number one, and number two, which may actually result in mortalities, uh, which would mean losses to the farmer who's involved in the feedlotting. Um, then another thing that also happens as a result of feedlotting was um, in the case of feedlotting, most of these animals, they are coming from different areas. Um, there will be stress of transportation. And when we look at our at cattle, um, in the natural environment, they're used to grazing. So now we have changed their diet um, and we've put them in a very small space. And this actually results in, in, in a level of stress, which, which we, we have seen that it can be managed within the first five days. So during that period, because of that stress, those animals, they actually become immunocompromised or they, they can't actually resist any form of disease. And uh, one other fact that I want you to note is that for most of the cattle in Zimbabwe, um, there are actually carriers of diseases like gall sickness. And uh, because of that, we have to take specific action, uh, like the injection of oxytetracyclines. Uh, for example, um, cupamycin LA, which you can see on the right side of the slide. Um, and during this period, we also don't encourage farmers to vaccinate their animals to, 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 the, um, to the infection. Uh, uh, because one thing that, that I would want you to understand is that vaccinations are just weakened forms of disease. Um, so, so, so if we vaccinate within the gate phase, which is the first five days, uh, first three to four days, I would say, um, that may mean that the animals may actually not, no, 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 not, not seroconvert or not gain immunity, uh, or they may succumb to an infection. Um, I hope that's clear enough. Um, then I move on to the last component, uh, which are the vaccines that we recommend in, in feedlotting. So we basically recommend uh, the vaccination with botulism, anthrax, and black leg. And these three, uh, they, they can come as a combination, uh, which is called three-in-one, uh, which means you can actually vaccinate against these. And usually the first vaccination that we do, we do it on day five. Um, and the reason why we vaccinate against this particularly is that for botulism, um, in some fields they use uh, chicken droppings. So there's exposure to botulism because it's usually found in decomposing uh, material. Um, then anthrax is key to be controlled because whenever, if an outbreak comes, it will literally clear all the animals within a short time without showing any pre-monetary uh, clinical signs. Then black leg, we believe that it's a disease of animals that are in good condition. And because we are pen fattening, these animals are definitely going to get into good condition and exposing them to the risk of uh, black leg. I'm not going to get into the um, nitty gritties of these diseases because of uh, our, our time. Um, then another disease that we also vaccinate against is lumpy skin. And lumpy skin, we see it um, in the form of, it, it, the animals will have uh, even, evenly distributed lumps uh, on their body. Um, then I move on to the next, next uh, stage or next phase. Um, so the next phase is uh, acclimatization. So acclimatization um, usually takes between 10 to 14 days. And within this period, the animals are basically adapting to the new forms of diet. And what's important at this stage is to, is, is to, is to give them as much roughage as possible, uh, in addition to the, to the feed, uh, according to the recommendations to the feed companies. And uh, this is really important because 
um, the roughage is very important in, in saliva production. Um, and it, during this period, we have to go through a, a transition where, 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 where there is slow introduction of the um, high energy diet. And this allows adaptation of the ruminal flora. Because when you look at the um, ruminant stomach, it's, it, it is mainly comprised of bacteria and protozoa that are res responsible for, for digesting uh, the feed. And also, uh, uh, they're also important in, in, in protein synthesis and um, other things like that. So you get to see that initially, because these animals were on a, on a pasture, on, on pastures, they will have more of uh, the, um, the bacteria that break down what we call cellulolytic bacteria that break down the, the high fiber um, and less of the bacteria that are responsible for breaking down the, 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 the high energy, which is coming from the feed companies. And another thing that I would recommend in terms of uh, acclimatization during the acclimatization period is to observe uh, the different ages, genders and sizes which is where weighing your animals before they get into the feed loop becomes important. So that at least there, is no, there are no issues like bullying um, and, and things like that. And clean water is also mandatory. Uh, so I'll, I'll just zoom in on, on, on blood. So if you look at this picture that I put on the um, right side of the slide, um, this is a picture of animals that are at different levels of blood. So what happens when we start feeding high, high energy diet uh, without uh, appropriately following the acclimatization um, principles is that the animals then produce a lot of gas. They produce a lot of gas and this gas results in what we call tympani. And because the, as, as the bacteria break down the, um, the high energy diet, there's also uh, an increase in acid production, which is not usually the normal case when they are on pastures. So this then results in, a, um, in, 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 in lack of motility, what we call atony of the rumen. And with, with the accumulation of fluid, the fluid will then, not, will then result in, in blood because the animal will not be able to do what we call belching, which is basically like, um, um, releasing the gas through the, the mouth, through the esophagus into the mouth. So that's what happens. So the first animal on the left um, is, is, is mildly bloated. And if you look at it, the left, left rib is, uh, is raised. Then the one in the middle um, is, is moderately, um, moderately bloated. And I, I need you to know that, uh, to understand that the the rumen, which is the biggest part of the rumen and stomach, is on the left. So that's what's, resu what's resulting in, 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 in it um, enlarging the less left side first. Um, then the one on the rightmost is actually severely bloated. So to manage uh, blood, uh, we recommend, because blood comes in two forms, there's what we call frothy blood, which you get when your animals are on lush pastures or those very first pastures. And this is basically managed by products like blood guard, which I know is not on the market, but you can uh, easily use uh, home remedies like you mix green soap with, uh, with water to form a an olive green color that you can drench. You can drench about two liters per animal and it usually clears. Um, but when it comes to free gas blood, which is more common in free blotting, uh, that one may require the usage of a token and cannula. And I would recommend you to, to work with a, with a qualified uh, veterinarian or a para-veterinarian that can assist you uh, or train your, your staff on, on doing that. So in summary, um, I hope I'm within time. In summary, um, these are the activities that we recommend for the induction therapy or for the induction program. Um, so on day one, that's when we do the dipping, um, dosing and taking of our animals. Um, then day five, we do our first 
um, vaccination and we can do the three in one at that point. Then by day 15, we do our um, second vaccination. And at this point, even if we vaccinate, our animals would have adapted and they'll, they'll, they'll be in a better space. They will not be stressed, uh, which may result in, 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 immunocompro in, them, in, in them becoming immunocompromised. Um, yeah, um, thank you. And that was my presentation. Well, many thanks, uh, there, Dr. Choga, for the great presentation and explaining the importance of uh, maintaining uh, healthy beef, uh, healthy beef cattle, and also uh, the recommendations on how to prevent and treat uh, different cattle diseases and parasites uh, that are common in our country. Before we let you uh, go, Doc, where can farmers find Cooper's Animal Health? Uh, so basically, we are um, in Harare. We are at 29 Anthony Avenue. I thought I'd, I put the address here. Sorry. Uh, so we are on 29 Anthony Avenue in Masasa. Um, and um, in Buluweyo, we are on number 10 Falcon Street. So basically, we've got those two, 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 two branches. Uh, but we also sell through um, a number of um, agro dealers or vet shops, uh, because our model is mainly supplying those um, to sell into the farming community. Uh, but if there are farmers that would want to purchase for 